In this tutorial, I'm going to take a look at some of the ways you can create manipulate UVs inside Houdini. Um, I'll try to keep this one reasonably short because it's hard to make UVs very exciting, but there are some really useful tools in here. I would say Houdini's biggest drawback when working with UVs is it can be quite hard to find what you want and the naming conventions aren't uh, as straightforward as I would like. Um, but once you know what you're looking for, there's some really powerful stuff in there. In fact, in game studios that I've worked in, in the past, I've written uh, Maya nodes, um, Maya digital assets for Houdini that purely work with UVs because it's nice to be able to access the powerful UV tools inside Houdini from Maya so that all the artists can use them. Now, the first thing we want to do is uh, set up a scene to create our UVs in. So take a new scene and drop in a file object and open that up and you'll see you have a file node and in here I'm going to load in a model that I've created especially for this tutorial. Um, it's a model of a robot that has a nice combination of curves and geometric shapes uh, which we can use to demonstrate setting up UVs. Now, uh, first of all, we want to be able to see our UVs. And the way we do this is if you take a look in your scene view, you'll see uh, at the moment it's showing the perspective view. And if we open that up and change our view, then we have access to the UV viewport here. So here you can see we have an empty 2D grid. Um, it's empty because there are no UVs on the robot at the moment. So if we set it back to perspective. Ideally, we want to be able to see both of these at the same time. So the way we can do this is uh, open up, split our pane so that we have two views inside it. And for a long thin pane, you're better with two views side by side. And then this one, we can change to our UV viewport, or we can use the shortcut which is space five. Oops, I made the wrong one. So space one takes you back to uh, perspective and space five will take you to the UV viewport. And now we can see our UVs as we work on our model. So at the moment, this robot has no UVs. If we open up our geometry spreadsheet, uh, the UVs are um, generally created in uh, vertex attributes. The reason for this is if we created them on points, we wouldn't be able to separate them across edges um, and all our UVs would wrap around, which obviously isn't going to give us the results that we want. So we, except in uh, very unusual circumstances, we would set our UVs up on our vertices. And this is what UVs do by default. So the first tool I'm going to show you um, in some ways isn't really a UV tool um, but it's something that you'll probably use when you're working with UVs and this is called UV Quickshade and what this will do is place a texture onto your object and for the Quickshade um, certainly when we're setting them up we quite often just use our grid texture um, and this will give us an idea of whether the UVs are well distributed and if we're getting any stretching in them. Um, if you're setting up an object with a texture on it then you can stick your um, colour texture in here and um, you can see that your UVs are set up correctly. So this is really just a preview. Um, it isn't a proper shader uh, so all you're seeing is um, the color values from your texture. Um, so this is purely for setting up your UVs. Uh, at the end of the tutorial, I'll show you also how you can very quickly access the Houdini equivalent of a PBR shader. And that way you can see how your, all your textures are working on your object. Um, but for actually working with UVs, this is ideal. The other thing to note about this is um, because there are no UVs 
on my object. Uh, UV Quickshade is aware of that and it's created some for me. Uh, but its ability to create UVs is very limited. So we can project them in the different axes and we can scale them. But that's pretty much all we can do. Um, this uh, texture parameters only becomes available if you don't have any UVs on your object already. So normally you would stick this on the bottom of your chain uh, and use it to display any UVs that you've created further up. And it will use the UVs that you've created rather than making its own. Uh, when you're working with UVs, um, to start with they all contain the uh, text UV. So you can hit the tab and type in UV and you'll get a list of them. Or alternatively, you'll find them inside the material folder. So here you can see we've got all our UV tools. Uh, first, of all, go, first of all, I'm going to show you three very simple UV tools. Um, we have UV Unwrap. We have UV Project and UV Texture. Uh, all of these will create UVs from scratch and they do it in a very simple straightforward way and you will have come across these tools elsewhere. Um, most of the time you probably want something a bit more sophisticated, certainly if you're working on a complicated model. But if your model is quite simple, one of these might do. Um, I'm going to look at them together because they're quite similar and they overlap to some extent as well. So first of all, look at the UV Unwrap tool. And um, you've probably come across this before. I know this is one of the tools that I use a lot in Maya. It simply uh, takes a number of planes. Six planes is probably ideal because then you have your positive and negative X, Y and Z planes. Um, and for every face or collection of faces, it looks to see um, which of those planes it's most directly aligned to and groups those planes together and projects onto those. So you can see a uh, face like this, um, it has, uh, it's grouped them together. Let's see, uh, for example, the, um, the body of the robot is quite a good one to show you because it's actually split it, um, although there's a bevel here, it's split it uh, right in the corners, um, which is quite a nice result if we uh, we're going to be texturing this, the robot body. Um, we can play around with it a little bit. If we change the spacing, we can reduce the spacing between the parts. But you'll see that the um, the layout isn't very good. There's a lot of big spaces in here. Um, so if you're using that, you probably want to follow it up with uh, a secondary node, um, which is UV layout. And UV layer is basically a packing tool. So you can see now it's packed much better. Um, everything gets a bit bigger UV space. And uh, we'll, we'll go back to this later because uh, there's some clever things you can do with it. Uh, so that's UV unwrap. UV project, again, is very straightforward. All it does is takes a series of projection types um, and applies them to your UVs. In this case, we have an orthographic projection. Um, it's projecting everything straight in the Z direction, um, which you're not likely to use very often. Uh, you'll see there's a collection of different types of projections. Um, so for example, cylindrical will project uh, from a cylinder around your object, uh, but give you some stretching at the top and bottom. Uh, I have to admit, I don't use this very often. Um, there's the occasional uh, object where this will work. For example, if you're using a cylinder or a sphere, this might be the best way of setting it up. Um, you'll note here that we could also assign it to points. Um, let's have a look at our geometry spreadsheet. So 
uh, because I put it on points now, it's sitting in our point group, but the default is to assign it to our vertices. Um, and in most cases, this is where you want to work with your UVs. Um, just in case you aren't aware of it, uh, all a UV consists of is a um, an X and Y coordinate, and which sits in a 2D plane rather than a 3D plane. The U and uh, V coordinate are the first and second components of the vector. So um, for each point on the surface of the model, you're referencing a point on this 2D texture. And the texture is stretched so that all those points sit correctly on the surface. Um, the final one of our three simple UV tools is UV texture, um, which uh, will do um, your projections again. So there's some overlap between these. Um, what's useful about UV texture is it allows you to do some quite clever things with uh, NURBS objects. So let's say I create a torus. Oops, I didn't actually want to create it there. Let's stick it inside our file node and hook that up to our UV texture. Um, so our torus lets us uh, assign to um, splines. So at the moment, this isn't a NURBS object, but if we convert it to a NURBS object, you can see that it um, is now taking into account the shape of the splines on the object and projecting around them. And we can play around with this a bit. Um, when this is really useful is if you're uh, if you've made a tool that creates surfaces from scratch using curves, then you can use the curves that you've built the surfaces from to determine the way the UVs sit. Um, and this gives you a, a lot of control over automatically generated UVs. Uh, so it's definitely worth uh, knowing about this uh, for. Um, for those circumstances. Uh, some of the other options we have in here, um, this might be quite useful if you're, let's turn this back into a polygon mesh. Um, I need to make it a polygon. So what face will do is take every face and find the project best projection for it. Um, so everything is being projected straight on. Uh, it, this isn't very good because you'll get a lot of seams. Basically every seam is cutting your UVs, which is very inefficient. But if you're working with a simple object, it might be uh, an easy way to set it up. Uh, so if we run this through our UV layout, you see, we've just got a bunch of separate faces. So not something you use very often, but in some circumstances, it's useful to know about it. Now, I'm going to take these three nodes, the UV Unwrap, UV Project, and UV Texture, and uh, call these simple UVs, and then move on to uh, some of the more sophisticated UV tools. Uh, first one I'll look at fairly briefly is the UV pelting tool. Um, if you're a character artist, I'd imagine you're very familiar with this. I'm not, so I have to admit it's something that I've never used in Houdini. Um, but I'll show you briefly how it works. Um, so this is called UV pelt. Pretty straightforward. And Let's plug our robot in. Now, what the UV pelting tool will do is um, it works on 
uh, areas um, with a continuous set of UVs. Um, it will take the edges of those areas and stretch them out um, either to a circle or to the shape of a primitive that you've provided it with. And um, you can, uh, if you imagine all the points inside that joined by springs, it will try to push them apart. Um, so um, you get a nice smooth distribution of UVs across the surface. Uh, this works very well for organic shapes, which is why character models modelers tend to use it a lot. A um, uh, classic situation would be if you imagine uh, an animal, um, an animal's pelt removed from the animal and then pinned out and stretched as much as possible onto a 2D surface. So when we're working with UVs, we're always taking a 3D object and trying to fit it to a 2D surface. Um, and there are just numerous ways to do that. Um, I'll show you a quick example. So this robot isn't very suitable because he's made of lots of discrete shapes. Uh, but we can make, uh, we can separate out part of this model. So if I take, let's take his body and delete non-selected. So now we have his body and run that through the pelting tool. At the moment we're not getting any results because his body is a um, it's a continuous closed object so there aren't any edges for it to grab. So uh, what we need to do is set up an edge cut group and to do that we hit the little arrow and we can select edges in the viewport. First of all we'll turn it to edges. we got now um, if we double click double click we can select an edge loop uh, so what I want to do here is um, separate out these faces into um, uh, we just split them along the edges so that it unwraps nicely and then we've got some edges to work with and then hit enter and you'll see we now have um, we have our faces laid out in the middle and we have a bunch of springs pulling them to the outside and we can increase the tension on the string the springs which will pull it out and if we increase our number of iterations it again will smooth everything out a bit. Uh, so you can see now we have a uh, much more realistic uh, distribution of UVs and we don't have any overlapping. So if I stick that through my UV quick shade, you'll get an idea of how it looks. Um, so we're not getting, we're getting some stretching, but not too much. Let's see if we can increase our iterations. No, I don't think we can do them anymore boundary strings. Uh, we can play around with them a little bit. Uh, I think we're getting some problems here. Um, so what we could do is add these edges. And stretching is still not great. Uh, I'm not going to play around with this much longer because really this is not how you would want to texture a robot. Um, it's much more suitable for organic shapes. Uh, I'll quickly demonstrate with the pig's head, which is a, a bit more of a suitable object. So if we stick that into our pelt, edges. Uh, the pig's head by default is split up already so we're going to stick the UV project node in there and uh, project it from the front and then 
everything is now part of one new VSET. Uh, so go back into Pelt and we want to make some splits. Now we've separated part of his head and uh, we're getting our pelting here on his face. Um, this, these UVs are in the way, so the easiest way to get rid of that is go back to our UV project and move it off to one side. Now the pelt will only work on one discrete group of faces at a time. Um, the way to determine which one you're working with is using a hint primitive. So if you switch on the primitive numbers, uh, zero, which we're using at the moment, is obviously within the face. If we wanted to do the base, uh, let's say we'll take 2693, and now we're working with the underside of the pig. Um, this is a limitation that we can only work on one at a time. So if you wanted to do both of these separately, you'd have to do the pelting twice. Let's go back to zero. And now you can see the results you're getting are a little bit more sensible with a pig, though we would want to make some more splits and divide them up in a, an easier way to stretch everything out neatly. So that's as much as I'm going to look at for now with pelting. Uh, I'll stick him in a new group. Just check where we're getting errors. I'm not sure where we're getting errors on this. So the next tool we're going to look at is one that is uh, something I do use a lot, which is really useful, um, particularly when working with um, something slightly less organic, like the robot, uh, and when working uh, with procedural models, which 90% of the time is what I would be doing. Um, and that is the... Uh, UV flatten tool takes every piece in your object and tries to flatten it out as much as possible and in order to do this you will probably need to create seams on your objects so if you imagine a cardboard box um, you could squash a cardboard box down as flat as possible um, but in order to uh, texture every size of it separately can so to completely unfold it you need to uh, make some cuts in it so you would cut down the sides and then you can unfold it completely um, so there are several stages to the unflattened node uh, let's hook up our robot so the first thing it does is it takes all the pieces and tries to flatten them as much as possible um, and then when we uh, start working with this, we have the option to add seams. So these will be cuts that are applied before the unflattening. And then the last thing it does is it lays it out into um, as optimal a shape as possible. Um, doesn't do quite as good a job as the UV layout tool, so you might want to use this afterwards. Um, you can set this up so that it's uh, something you do relatively manual. So you would interactively set up all your cuts uh, to get the best results possible. But it's also, there's a way of setting it up so that it will do this more automatically. I'll show you uh, some of the manual tools first of all. Um, so let's take a look at our robot head. You can tell that's his head because his eyes are there. And we're going to make some cuts because at the moment, um, 
it's not doing a very good job of unwrapping him because everything's squished together. So we want to cut along these seams and the edges to unfold him. So um, here we use a tool. Uh, so if, you, if you've if you got the tool selected, you might need to hit enter to enter it. Um, uh, and it, this will bring up a toolbar at the top that gives you to access to some of the tools. It's also possible to access them um, as we normally do by clicking on uh, the little arrows at the end. So we could select a group of seams using this arrow or we can do the same thing uh, inside our tool. So if we grab some seams you can see it's cutting as I go along. Oops. And already you can see getting a better shape out of this. Uh, let's bring in a bit more in the corners. Uh, you can see with the pelting tool the different shapes um, of the faces have stretched a bit. So we have another tool that's really useful that allows you to straighten out edges. Um, and this is uh, the aligned vertices in U and V direction. So if we click this, it brings up our vertices. Uh, we could also do it by opening up our vertex pins and adding here but we'll do it interactively in the viewport so what we want to do is take a line of vertices and tell it that these are to be straight so you don't need to grab everyone and hit enter and it's unfolded it in a slightly weird way so if I don't undo that and just stick uh, rather than going right the way across the top, which might confuse it, I'll just stick to the corners. So let's go right on the edges. Sure why that's not working. Let's try it in the viewport. Uh, let's grab a few of these. Okay, that's doing what we want now. So you can see it's taken everything along this line and it's straightened it out uh, and aligned it with the V direction. And if we take the other side. You'll see it's done the same and we're getting something that's square on the grid now and then we can do it on the other side of the robot as well so you can see everything's lining up a bit better do it on this face. And last in the back of his head. So we're getting, we're not quite there yet, uh, but we're getting something that is much closer to the shape we would want for his head. Um, 
Now, obviously this is far from procedural. Uh, so I'm going to show you a way you can use this that is more procedural. Uh, first thing we'll do is, uh, currently we've got enable manual layout switched on. The reason you would switch this on is uh, because when you turn it off, it will every time you change a piece, it will try to refit everything. And if you're actually working on a piece, you don't want it to do that. Um, it would be really annoying because you keep losing the piece that you're working on. But for now, we'll turn it off and it's doing a repack. Um, so now we have uh, a non-flattening stage and we have a layout stage, which are both done procedurally. But we don't have any seams. So in order to create seams, we have another node. And this is called UV auto seam. The auto seam node uses the curvature of the object to try and pick good positions for seams. Let's hook it up to the robot. Uh, you can see an interactive display of where the seams are appearing on the ro robot and it uh, creates islands, um, so discrete areas of the, your object and then tints them in different colours. Uh, uh, the way that it works is it takes a um, scattergun approach to grabbing lots of surfaces and then it tries to merge them together. Um, so it'll take lots of random points across your object, look at how those points sit uh, relative to the points next to them and then if they're they appear to be on one plane, it will try to merge them. And we can change both the grain tolerance, which is the number of scattered points, and the merge threshold in order to get different results. Um, so if we play around with these, we can either achieve more or less different islands. Um, if we look in our geometry spreadsheet uh, and go to our primitives, then it's uh, created an attribute called island number. and these uh, separate the islands out into groups. Uh, we can actually display these. Um, well, we're displaying them anyway, but we can uh, persistently display them through our node network using a color node. And if we change this to primitive, stick on random from attribute, and then give it the same name. So the name of our attribute. Oh, just a sec, I'll restart. Okay, luckily that seems to have done an autosave, um, so I'll just go through it again. Uh, one uh, really useful trick, uh, if you have a file that crashes and every time you reopen it, it crashes again, if you turn off auto update, that will uh, simply load in all the nodes without actually cooking them, um, so you're very unlikely to get it to crash and then you can just delete the last thing you did. Uh, so it's a really nice way of being able to catch something. But in this case, it seems to be okay. So um, as I was saying, go to the geometry spreadsheet. Uh, our attribute is underscore, underscore, island, underscore, num, and then two underscores again. So we'll type that into our color. And hope it doesn't crash this time. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, now we're getting um, a different color for every island. And it's a little bit easier to see, I think. So if we go to our auto seam, let's turn our display back on here. We can play around with some of our values. Switch our UV viewport back on. And for some reason, this isn't updating. 
Oh, that seems to be working now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we'll leave this for now because uh, we can play around with it once we're um, once we're doing the unflattening. I'm going to create a new un UV flatten node um, because we've set up quite a lot of parameters in that one. So we should largely be able to use this as the default. So we'll keep our color in there for now, so we can see the different colors of the faces. And on this, we need to set it up to be more procedural. So first of all, um, we have some seams. So the UV auto seam group, um, auto seam node creates an edge group called seams. So you can see it's there. So we just need to tell our uh, UV flatten node to use this group. And you can see it's uh, using the seams that exist here. And then we want to turn off our manual layout so it does some packing for us. Uh, what we're getting here isn't great. And this is because we need to play around a bit more with our auto seams. So we want to split things up a little bit more. See, with uh, grain tolerance set quite high, so it's not creating many. In this case, it wouldn't be starting off with many um, points on the robot, so there isn't much. Uh, there aren't many calculations for it to do. So you can see the head is still being created as one object. So we want to make more individual points, and then the merge there. So we'll start merging them back together again. Uh, you see here we've gone a bit too high, pushing things off a bit so that they overlap. So we'll bring that back down again. And basically, we want to play around until we get an optimal difference between um, having things uh, not overlap, but also not in so many pieces that we um, are splitting things up unnecessarily. And then, as I said before, the layout tools on UV layout are a bit better. Uh, so if we stick it into UV layout, you can see it packs it all a bit better. Um, it much, does a much better job of filling in uh, some of the shapes. So obviously there's some tweaking to do for each shape, but you can see that if you know roughly what kind of shapes you're working on, uh, then it should be possible to come up with some settings that will uh, allow you to procedurally UV and unwrap uh, in an efficient way most of the time. Now, one other thing to note is the UV flatten tool um, will stick a grid on um, for you to see your UVs in the interactive viewport. And if you use your mouse wheel, you can change the size of that grid. Um, it just gives you a little bit of visual feedback. So we run really quickly through this collection of nodes, the UV auto seam and the UV flatten. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute about UV layout. Um, but UV auto seam and UV flatten uh, really deserve their own tutorial. So we may well come back to that at some point and go into some of the um, more detailed aspects of them. Um, but for now, we're just looking at some of the, the ways you can deal with UVs. So we'll move on to some of the other tools. So. I would put the UV flatten and auto seam into our more complex UV tools. Now let's quickly run through some of the options on the UV layer. Um, I'm going to go back to the camera, turn off the editing preview. Uh, so this is a fantastic tool. Um, it does a really nice job of packing everything uh, procedurally. And you've got quite a lot of control over it. Uh, so some of the things you can change. Uh, we can use the surface area of the uh, model 
to influence the scale. It looks like it's doing a pretty good job of that already. Um, uh, we can, uh, as I pointed out before, it was packing uh, objects inside other objects. So if you've got a closed shape, it'll pack inside that, which most of the time we'd want to be on. That saves a lot of space. Um, we can change the padding so we can have larger gaps between our um, points. If, for example, you, if you're creating a uh, light map UV set, you might want these to be quite far apart because you're probably using quite uh, low res texture for lighting um, and you're going to get some bleeding so you want to keep all these nice and far apart. Uh, if we're, UV, if we're uh, texturing then we can keep them a lot closer together. Um, this is really nice tool so this will find islands that are identical and you've got some tolerance on there as well and it will pack them on top of each other. So um, for example uh, if you were um, putting textures on that have a, um, a surface texture that is, can be reused on identical surfaces then we can use this to save space. Uh, obviously this wouldn't work for light mapping and we can also use ones that find mirrors and it will pack them together as well. And uh, if we go back up the top, uh, you it's currently uh, using uh, the 2D space to align your islands but you can use their position in 3D space as well, um, which in this case actually does a better job of straightening everything up. Uh, so it's looking at its XYZ alignment in 3D space. So that's just a brief look at the UV layout. It'll give you an idea of uh, how useful it can be if you're uh, automatically generating UVs. So the rest of the UV tools um, all really fall into one category and they're about editing UVs. So in the same way that you can edit attributes in the 3D viewport, you can edit the UVs in the 2D viewport. Uh, so I'm going to grab all of these and go through them relatively quickly. So these are UV brush and UV edit, which are very interactive. And we have UV transform, which is works in the same way as our transform node. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And we have UV smooth, um, which will attempt to even out all our UVs and UV views. I'll just run through these very quickly. Uh, let's come down here so we've got something to work with. Right. UV brush, if we hit the enter tool, uh, it'll bring up our brush and we can start moving the UVs about in the viewport. Um, not something we'd want to do with uh, man-made shape like this. Um, but if you have a, a natural or maybe a pelt or something, a natural shape, you might find it useful to be able to shuffle some of the UVs about. Uh, UV edit is relatively similar. So if we go in here, um, and have our selection tool on. Uh, there's a little button up here that allows you to select points in the viewport and edit them. So we can just move these around. So again, it's just a manual tool for tweaking uh, some of your UVs. Um, sometimes this might be the quickest way to fix a UV problem if you don't mind it not being procedural. So 
UV transform is really straightforward. This works on all your UVs. So you can start moving them around, scaling them. Uh, you can rotate them. Uh, yeah, most likely to want to rotate them around the z-axis. The UV smooth node um, will average out the distances between the UVs. So you can see it's pushing everything apart. Uh, again, if you're working on an organic shape, this might be quite useful um, so that you don't get any overlapping. Uh, the UV Fuse node uh, you can use to merge your uh, UVs together based on distance. Uh, so uh, we can, if we increase the distance, uh, you'll see it just starts snapping them together. Uh, I think the most useful use for this, uh, particularly if you're working procedurally, is uh, if we switch it to grid and it will snap the UVs to the nearest grid. So if you're working with um, really low res textures, uh, you might have use for this. Uh, I can't say that it's one that I've ever used. So these I'm going to put in a group and call them UV editing tools. Uh, I told you at the start that I would um, show you how to set up a basic Houdini PVR material so that you can display all the textures. But before I do that, I'm going to take my robot with his uh, UUVs and take him into substance and give him some nice textures. So I'll uh, resume this video once I've got that model. Okay, I'm back now with some PBR textures which I've made in substance for the robot using the new UV set that we created. Um, in a minute I'll show you how to hook them up so that you can see all the different textures in Houdini. Uh, first of all, this, I want to tell you about something quickly that I thought I should mention and that's the concept of layers in Houdini. Um, there used to be a node in Houdini called a layer SOP, which um, is no longer available. And this was the way you used to move between different UV sets. So, for example, if you wanted a, uh, a base texture layer, but also a lighting layer with different UVs, um, you need to create a new UV set. And the way the layer SOP was, you would connect it, it worked, so you would connect it into your network and then move up a layer and any UVs created after that were created in a, a second UV set and then if you wanted to go back and work in the first UV set you had to create a new layer SOP and go back down a layer. As you can imagine this wasn't a very straightforward way of working and thankfully it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so now if you want to create a second UV set uh, let's say we have our UV layout here and we want to just make a straight projection. So we're sticking a UV project node. Um, as it is, this will overwrite our UVs, but if we stick in uh, two on the end, we now have a new UV set. And if we open up our geometry spreadsheet, you can see that we have the UV and then we have UV2. Um, so these are all separate attributes. And if we want to display this in the viewer, um, in the place where the camera is, you see we now have access to two separate UV sets. So this will just read them from the model that you're working on. Okay, stick back in auto and delete that. Uh, okay, uh, materials are a huge subject in Houdini. Um, so. What I'm going to give you now is just a set of instructions um, to get textures displayed without attempting to understand why we're doing all this, um, which isn't something I normally like to do in my tutorials. Uh, but 
we will have a material tutorial relatively soon. Actually, gives you a little bit more background on how they work. We want to open up our material palette. Uh, and this gives us a link to a bunch of default shaders. Um, and the one that we want to use is called a principal shader. Uh, so the principal shader will allow you to uh, render things like normal maps and roughness real time in the display view. So we just drag this into here and we have the principal shader. You can make as many of these as you want. Um, and then let's give it a new name, we'll call it robot. And then in order to put it on our robot, we want to go uh, rather unhelpfully when we went into a material ta um, tab, it's taken us to the material menu. So we want to go back to our file menu and we want to add a new node called a material node. And we hook this up to the material that we just created. Um, so these two little icons here, the first one will take you to whichever material is connected here, which is a useful shortcut. And the second one will open up a list of all the objects in the scene to allow you to select a material. Now we've created our material inside the material palette, which is here. So there's our robot material. So we just hook that up. And you can see already that he looks a little bit different. Um, so if we hit the jump button, it'll take us back to our uh, material menu. You're seeing a slightly different version here because you're seeing it in the network. Um, but the parameters pane is exactly the same. So by default, uh, the principal shader has no textures on it and it uses the um, vertex color. So that's why we're still seeing our vertex colors on the robot. So we could turn this off. Uh, actually, that doesn't do much for us, uh, probably because the, um, the color that we have here isn't on our points, it's on primitives. So let's go back into our object and we'll, oops, we'll delete those colors. But we can just turn that off. and go back to our material. Um, by default, Houdini uh, always multiplies your albedo by a base color, uh, which is gray for some reason. Now, if you're gonna multiply it by the base color, that wants to be white. And now we go to our textures and set them up. So our base color is has exactly the same name. Uh, and we have a roughness texture and we have a metallic texture. And we also have a normal texture which sits in its own menu. So if we enable that. Uh, you have a, an option to add normal or bump, but we want normal. And you can see pretty quickly that's inverted. So I'll flip the Y to get a better representation of that. Uh, now we want to tweak this a little bit more. If we go back to our surface menu, uh, this value here for roughness, once you've got a texture attached, tells it how much of the texture to use. So we'll ramp this up to one. So all the roughness is coming from the texture. And metallic assembly will wrap up so that it's using the metal from the texture. Uh, you're still looking a little bit odd. Um, part of the reason for this is that we don't have any lighting set up. So let's stick an environment map on. So we want to go back, this time go back up to the object menu. And in the lights menu up here, you'll see that there's an option for an environment light. So we create that and hook it up to an environment map. 
and I've one of the substance environment maps here. And instantly you'll see that our textures are looking a lot better. Possibly a bit over shiny, but uh, generally he doesn't look too bad at all. Uh, we can go back into our material and play around with some of the settings. Um, so you can see that this isn't a true PBR shader. It's not doing exactly the same thing as, as a PBR. In fact, you've got far more settings here. Um, you can, uh, for example, set up displacement. So we could have exported a height map from Substance as well and had some proper displacement on him rather than just normals. And we have a lot more options here, such as an isotropy. Um, we can add a, a coat, so a second specular map, um, subsurface scattering and so on. Um, the important thing about the principal shader is that it's all in the real-time viewport and it's the only sh shader in Houdini that can do that. Um, it's basically pre-rendered so that everything inside it is uh, optimized for viewing in real time. This means you can actually go in and tweak the settings inside it. So if we open it up, you'll see you get uh, a message saying uh, you can't edit it, which is different from every other shader in Houdini. In fact, with every other shader, you would be encouraged to go in and tweak it. But the other shaders um, won't render it fully in real time. You have to render them out, um, which is not so useful when you're setting up textures. Um, and if you're used to games, you're used to seeing these things in real time. So that's it for this tutorial. And hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, I'm afraid it's quite hard to make UVs very exciting. It's not my favorite topic, um, but they are something that is really useful to know about. So you don't need to think about it next time. Uh, please like and subscribe and hopefully I'll see you again for a new tutorial.